vision and mission of the library is to provide for a welcoming place for lifelong learning. If you stay the same, then you're falling behind. Greenwich Library Reference, how may I help you? So you have to keep innovating, you have to keep changing, you have to keep evolving. It's not that it has to be something other than what it was, it has to be something in addition to what it was. You really need to have one overarching vision as to where you want the library to go in the future, how you want to anticipate the needs of the community. Our goal throughout was to ensure that the library continued to be the community hub, really the community heart, that it has been for so many years. This new lower level floor, it's taken space that was more administrative and opened it up to the public, including a brand new entrance, the Berkeley Theater. This theater that we're sitting in is going to be just something people are gonna be amazed with. Handicapped accessible. The cafe, it's going to be right up front and center. The cafe is a concessionaire partnership with Abelis. What was important to our patrons was that they were looking for good food, healthy food that was affordable. And right behind the cafe is the Marx Family Black Box Theater. The Learning Lab provides opportunities for adult patrons to develop their technology skills on every level. There were some architectural goals that we kept very much in mind and, and chief among them were connectivity of the three different sections of the building that stood sometimes alone. The connectivity that's characterized by the floating staircase that now goes up from the lower level to the first floor. We haven't increased the footprint of the Peterson Business Wing, but what we've done is we reorganized it. There are five new meeting rooms. In addition, we have three phone booths. Also on the first floor is a fully renovated reading room where people could go for very quiet private study or quiet collaborative study in a wide open room. Well, the reading room is awesome. I imagine that's gonna be one of the most popular spaces within the library. Very rarely does a public library anywhere in the country have an oral history project. So many things come alive in this. So I'm excited about being right up there on the first floor. The Innovation Lab, I think, is just truly amazing. The Innovation Lab is a very exciting addition to the library. It is a new venture. We are 100% dedicated to STEAM learning. STEAM stands for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. We have an epilogue laser, which is really only usually available at the finest schools and universities. We have a really extensive suite of 3D printers. The libraries have always been about lifelong learning. So we're just taking that to a more modern, innovative, progressive direction. There's a, a much bigger area for teens to enjoy coming to the library and studying either individually or collaboratively. It's really a very dynamic space. No matter what kids' needs are, they will be able to do it here at the library. And it's not just educational, it also will provide a good social environment for them. The Constellation Room, that's what we call our program room in the Children's Library. And that has always been a wow factor for the community. We opened it up to more seating, so now we can accommodate more at story time. This has been just an incredible endeavor. It's roughly an $18 million investment. We had many people from the community that donated generously. The results are really awesome to see. There's only one Greenwich Library. And when we open these doors, it's going to be even better. Welcome to a special presentation of the Friday Friends Real Talk. We are celebrating the completion of Greenwich Library's 18-month Reimagine project. And though we can't celebrate together as we would like, we can reconnect virtually as we are doing tonight. This program is made possible through the support of the Greenwich Library Board of Trustees the Friends of the Greenwich Library, and the contributions by generous donors. I am Hilary Martin Lay, the chairman of the Friends of Greenwich Library and sponsors of the Friday Film Series. Our panel this evening will be speaking about the booksellers, 
a wonderful 2019 documentary about the antiquarian book trade in New York City. This is a movie for anyone who loves books, and I think we have a lot of those at Greenwich Library. It is my pleasure to welcome our panel, the film's director, D.W. Young, and two antiquarian book dealers who were featured in the film, producer Dan Wexler and Rebecca Romney. Our moderator tonight is Colin McEnroe, the host of the Colin McEnroe Show on Connecticut Public Radio and, a, and the author of a weekly syndicated column with Hearst Connecticut Media. We are so glad to have all of you with us this evening. Over to you, Colin. Thank you so much. So I, first of all, I want to say I just love this movie. And I wasn't sure that I would love this movie because I have a little bit of uh, literary PTSD. In the 1980s, uh, I was an author. Uh, and I wrote, uh, had two books published by then the Doubleday imprint. And these two books were, it's a term I'm looking for, failures. Um, and, and when you are a less successful author, one of the things that happens, uh, two things happened to me in a 48 hour period. One of them was I got a letter from Doubleday saying that both of my books were being pulled out of stock. And what that meant apparently was that they were going to pulp them or destroy them or something. Uh, and that I had the opportunity to buy as many copies as I wanted at the insider price, the insider author's price of 67 cents per copy. One of these was a hardcover book. And I was sort of thinking about what it would cost to go to a stationary store and just buy a book that had that many blank pages as a notebook. And I realized it would cost considerably more than 67 cents. So that in a sense, my writing had actually depressed the value of paper. Uh, I saw that as kind of a setback. And then we, we, in about another 24 hours, I got my periodic royalty statement. I was then represented by ICM, uh, by a very well-known known, uh, agent named Esther Newberg. And my royalty statements, always, uh, when I would take them out of the envelope, they always had parentheses around the numbers. <laughs> I understand it meant that I had not earned my advance back. Uh, there was no money to which I was entitled. And in fact, I should send Joyce Carol Oates a check for $75, which I always did. Um, but on this occasion, I opened the royalty statement and there were these really large numbers that did not have parentheses around them. And um, on further scrutiny, it turns out that the person next to me in the alphabet, at least this is my theory, at ICM, the author next to me was Shirley MacLaine. And they had stuffed her royalty st statement into my envelope. And, and it was like this large amount of money and it wasn't even for sales in the US or Europe. This is like for sales in the Pacific Rim area, Micronesia. This, she was selling more books on islands that had no written tradition than I was you know, in, in entirety. Uh, I don't know if people were buying them and making canoes out of them or something. And so at that point I decided I would stop being an author. Um, and although I did eventually write one more book, but um, setting all that aside, this movie has been so much fun to watch and now it's gonna be so much fun to talk about. And for those of you who've seen it, let's look at the trailer right now for just a little reminder uh, of how much fun this is. It's a film crew here at the moment. Why? A friend of mine's doing a documentary on booksellers and I'm a bookseller. It would be very interesting to stop somebody on the street and say, if I say rare book dealer, what do you think of? Older man, elbow patches. Tweed. <laughs> The Strand was founded by my grandfather in an area called Book Row. Our business was started by our father in 1925. People always asked him, how did you get all three daughters to work for you? And he would say, I guess I'm just lucky. In the 1950s, there were 368 bookstores in New York City. Today, I went and counted, and there were 79. One of the things I remember about those guys, they were very irritated if you wanted to buy a book. They were there so they could read all day. Collecting is about the hunt. The internet has killed the hunt. What the internet did was change the way we talked about what was rare. For a lot of dealers, it was devastating and it destroyed their livelihood. A lot of people wonder, where's the future of this industry going? It is consistently my experience as a younger dealer that I am talking to older dealers who are so pessimistic and they're saying, I don't know what you're gonna do. And I'm like, I have so many ideas. 
were part of a boom in independent bookshops that really engage with their neighborhood in a way that the old chain stores never did. I think it has to come with a love of the material. A good bookseller absolutely is another kind of discoverer and thinker of history. The people that I see reading actual books on the subway are mostly in their 20s. This is one of the few encouraging things you will ever see in a subway. There's obviously a love for it. It's frustrating at times. Is this something you wake up and you say, thank God, I found this? What else would you rather do? Here's an unusual title, Amish Love. Wow, that's quite a picture. Right, we still all want to know what that picture is, but we're not going to find out probably tonight. Uh, so uh, Hillary has already told you who they are, but let me remind you a little bit more about them. Yes, the filmmaker is D.W. Young, a Brooklyn-based filmmaker whose work is screened at festivals around the world. His documentary, A Hole in the Fence, and narrative feature, The Happy House, both released by First Run Features. Um, a native New Yorker, Dan Wexler, is a rare bookseller, publisher, and filmmaker. His documentary, More Than the Rainbow, premiered at Doc NYC in 2012 and later uh, screened as the opening night film at the Coney Island Film Festival, where it won the award for Best Documentary. He is the producer, if I didn't say that already. Uh, and in the film, you will see or have already seen Rebecca Romney, a rare book dealer based in the Washington, D.C. area, where she co-founded the firm Type Punch Matrix. She's the author of Printer's Error, Irreverent Stories from Book History. Since 2011, she has been the book specialist on the History Channel's hit Han Stars. So um, I, I think maybe uh, D.W. Young will begin with you. Uh, you could have made a film about anything. Um, why, what, how did, what drew you to antiquarian booksellers? Well, the, um, the short answer is it was Dan. <laughs> um, our other producer, Judith Mazaki, um, we're married as well. Um, had, you know, we had worked together on some things with Dan and become friends. And, um, you know, he mentioned he'd always had this idea to, that it thought that it'd be a great idea to make a documentary about the rare book world. He was obviously coming from an insider's perspective and I think had a lot of um, obviously sort of specific ideas of what that could be. And um, I think what we really latched on to the potential as well when we heard that um, we're both, you know, book lovers and English majors and I had an aunt and uncle who were in the trade long ago and um, and Dan had taken us to the, to, I think importantly, had taken us to the Antiquarian Book Fair in, in New York uh, like a year or two before. And I think seeing, and I'd never been, and seeing kind of the visual, I guess, uh, the other little visual variety, like the smorgasbord of material was really eye-opening. I think then from a cinematic standpoint, that kind of resonated. Um, although at the time we weren't thinking about it in that way, but I think also, you know, the idea that my sense of the people in the rare book world was there, but then also the idea that there was a visual potential too, I think was part of that. So I want to get the other two panelists to answer this question. When somebody makes a movie about your life and your livelihood and the thing that you love and the thing that you've chosen, I think inevitably you think, okay, I really want people to understand X. So Dan, for you, what, what, what did you really want people to understand about this thing that you love so much? Might need to unmute there. I don't know how that happened. All right, so I'm back. Um, the idea was floating in my head for a long time, really, to um, that there, there should be a film about the, the antiquarian book world. And it started with exposure to all the personalities, the characters um, in, in the trade, and also the customers, just the whole world. But I thought for a long time also about why wasn't there a film? I mean, I was a, a bit of a film buff, and I, you'd see documentaries all the time about art and photography. Um, and I think that was a big ingredient to it is that those worlds are so obviously visual. And when people think of books, they think of something maybe you do it privately, you sort of sit with your book and even book groups, you know, it's not something you think of immediately, oh, let's shoot that scene. But that the actual visual world of what I experience on a, on a day-to-day -day basis and, and tra through travel is such a rich visual experience that I thought whether you showed that from a distance or up close as we do sometimes when we zoom into a, just a little nugget inside of a, of a, of a volume, that that was gonna be very interesting for people to, to sort of latch onto and to get absorbed in. 
And so those were really the two main aspects, the, the different characters, the different voices, but also this visual universe of, of books that really had never gotten the exposure that I expected it would in film. How about you, Rebecca? What did, what did you want people to, to know that you thought maybe they didn't know about this world? Uh, I find that somewhat of a funny question just because I, I have enough experience talking with uh, journalists and doing PR things that I know, you know, you can sit with someone for hours and hours and give them in-depth descriptions of what you do and like really take your time to explain things. And then you see the article at the end and it's like really, really oversimplified and completely different angle than actually is accurate. And, you know, so coming to this film, I was very much like, they're going to do what they're going to do. Like, that's how the media works. I will give them my information. That is the sort of raw material and they're going to turn it into something. But this one was different. I have to say it really did feel like an insider's view. And I liked that a lot. If there was one message that I wanted to see in it, I actually did get to see it. I remember when I was watching the premiere of this, there was this one moment where it's showing a number of my colleagues talking and I'm kind of, um, I'm in the seat almost wiggling because I disagreed with a lot of the things that they were saying. I was like, oh, yeah, I know that, but no, that's not right. I don't think that's right. And then right at that moment, right, when I'm getting really uncomfortable, it cuts to me disagreeing with them. Yeah. <laughs> and I felt like, okay, so that's nice that that was represented, that there is more optimism and things like this in the world. But also it shows that we're not just one monolith, that there are a lot of different opinions that yes, we all are characters, but there are different strands of thought, there are different philosophies, there are different business models. And this felt really true to our world for that. I think the world tends to get very oversimplified in other scenarios. And this documentary felt very real. All right. Yeah, I think the first thing the movie does is make us kind of fall in love with some of these characters and with that in mind and also with the scene itself, uh, as uh, the filmmaker was just saying. So, Steve, uh, let's take a look at the clip uh, Book Fair. Might have a little be having a little trouble pulling that one up. So, Steve, let me know when you're ready with with book fair, um, and we'll come back to the uh, the discussion. I'll call. My name is Henry Wessels. I work with uh, James Cummins Books in New York, and it's another New York book fair, which is the roller coaster ride between tedium and great bits of commerce and discoveries. My PhD is in 16th century Spanish lyric poetry which explains why I'm totally broke. And after 15 years of academia, I left that in order to become an antiquarian book dealer. So I have had the pleasure of having really fantastic books in my hands. We have a third folio, which was J.P. Morgan's copy, which he bought in 1897. And at the same time, he bought a first edition of the first book ever printed, the Gutenberg Bible, for 2750 on vellum. It's probably now a $40 million. What we just got in like a few days before the fair, which is always exciting, um, is a Hemingway archive. And there was a Castro doll in the archive, which we were a little surprised to find. It's been a pretty good show. I mean, it's, you know, a little less to carry home. As you can see, I deal in really big books, so I really like it when some of them go away. Lift it up and put it back where it was. Oh, God. Okay, so, um, you know, I, I want to go back to what Rebecca said before, because I think I understand. I think I knew what she was referring to. But D.W. Young, there's kind of a series of turns in this documentary. At first, you kind of make us fall in love with that world that we just saw. Uh, you introduce these colorful characters and we see this, this world that's kind of bristling with a kind of life. And then there's a little bit of a funereal quality that creeps in as they start to talk about how the internet has just wrecked everything. Digital culture has just deprived them of the kind of special kind of hunting uh, and finding and discovering and selling that they loved so much. And then there's this other big turn. And I think it's kind of maybe kind of what Rebecca was talking about 
because at that point we're all getting kind of sad like oh wow we're just watching this lost world fade before our eyes and then there's this whole other conversation about what else can happen but maybe you can talk about uh dw young maybe you can talk about how you you structured that series of turns well i think you know the internet is like we're well into it so it's sort of after the fact at this point but i think like you know it's i'm interested i think in the to, in the degree to which like the internet has just upended everything in our you know around us so much so quickly and we're sort of in the middle of this moment and it's sort of very hard to, co to sort of come to grips with it so i think you know it's fascinating to see how in a, in a very sort of niche specialized trade it too has its sort of fundamental you know, issues with the internet and it's trying to evolve beyond you know that disruptive moment and how is it going to transform itself um but i think there's also you know there were the rare book trade had this sort of very long period hundreds of i don't know 100 years or longer where things basically stayed exactly the same more or less mm -hmm. i mean you could quibble with that but kind of the idea is you know things worked in a kind of similar way and the internet really i think changed a lot of that and it offered opportunity but also it sort of put was the end of an era in a very definitive way. And I think a lot of people in the book trade who were older and who, you know, kind of made their mark or sort of came into the trade before that, it's, it's, it's a kind of bittersweet, pretty, or bitter in some cases, mm -hmm. um, you know, tra uh, transformation of the trade. So I think it was inevitable that like that marked this sort of turning point moment and how to, how to represent that, how to kind of show how this trade was still sort of dealing with that was very important. Um, so this is the thing that before still, about the moment where you disagreed. Was that what the thing yes. that you disagreed about? Yeah. I mean, that's, that was one, that, that's, that's one of the things that I disagree about with my, my respected older colleagues, I would say. But uh, there are many dealers who still sort of resist the internet. And in fact, it's been more of things like the pandemic that have really pushed them to use the internet with virtual book fairs and selling online. But, you know, I have colleagues who are frustrated when someone asks for pictures of a $20,000 book and you're like, yes, people need pictures, you know? So this is a, this is a world I think that we're an unusual trade because a lot of people start their second career and you're considered young if you're under 50 in this trade. So many people are just here not planning to retire. They're planning to die as booksellers. You don't retire. And so I think, you know, this idea that we're just going to keep doing it the way that we've always done it, it feels sort of timeless and that is really appealing, but it also creates a sort of resistance because, you know, a lot of people really like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing until I die and I don't need to figure out Twitter. <laughs> so Dan, where do you fall on that continuum of optimism, pessimism, uh, we're, you're, you're I'm a personality that goes up and down. So even in the course of a single day, I can find myself in, <laughs> in both camps. Um, but I think what Rebecca said initially was, is so important that in, in this, there are these so many different viewpoints. And, and that goes back to the structure of the film, because so many documentaries will focus on the one character. There's a, you build your film around a single protagonist. And if you were to do that with the antiquarian book world, you'd really run the risk of just getting that perspective. And I think missing out on, on, on how um, you know, diverse it is in terms of the way you know, the thought process goes in terms of thinking about technology and how it affects what it is we do it and also how it affects the, the book itself as object. Um, so uh, you know, I, I use the technology myself and there's a lot of things about it um, that have actually, you can find now obscure scholarly books that used to take forever to find that now are available at the snap of your fingers. And why shouldn't those be readily accessible um, you know, to as many people as possible? Um, you'd hunt from used bookstore to used bookstore to try to find them and I mean, good luck. Uh, and then it's different with, with original material. So this, the types of things that booksellers gravitate toward uh, more unique material, manuscripts, um, things like that. So it's a constant evolution in terms of, of, of how, you know, the business has, has gone. And D.W. Young, trying to put myself in your shoes, and, and to the point that I think they were both making a little bit there, you must have, when you realized how many really colorful characters there were, and, and how different they were, you know, as somebody just said, you, you could have picked just one person and 
tried to show us that whole world through that one person. But you've got that guy, Dave Bergman, who I love. I mean, he's just kind of hilarious complaining about how uh, heavy all the books are. And yet he's also the guy who plays the softball about 19 times a week. Uh, you've got the John Hodgman uh, looking guy with the handle mustache and the, uh, the three sisters at Argosy. I mean, as a filmmaker, you must've been going nuts, just going, oh, th this is the happy hunting grounds, right? You've got so much to work with. Yeah, I mean, I think I think part of that is that I I always said I think Dan when we talked about this and we started and Judith talking about what the movie would be, you know, my initial impulse I think they you know also I think agreed with that or, or felt similarly. It was um, it was more about I was more interested in kind of exploring just the world, so to speak, hmm. than one person's story, like it being a, a narrative in that sense. So I think, but then yes, there's. How to limit that so i think by focusing on new york that was one way we contained ourselves from you know the enormous number of you know fascinating and really smart people in the rare book trade who, all, who you know if you go to the book fairs you have this international component you have people from all over the country and anyone and many many of them could have equally come into the film and been you know great interviews and had a lot to say but there's no end it's kind of like the books you know there's no end to that <laughs> So, um, you know, we had to sort of narrow our scope a little and making about New York where there's a great history, you know, of the book trade in New York. And it's still, I think the center, probably if there is one, at least in this country, and um, we're all based in New York. So there's that too. So that all I think helped in that regard. So, you know, Rebecca, one of the ways that some of the people in this movie define their lives is in terms of the hunt. Uh, in fact, I think it's Dave Bergman who says, yes, yes, you're looking, 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 and finally you find it and you have your orgasm and then you're all done and you never want to look at that stupid book again. Um, but I don't get the feeling that's the only way. And so, and we should say that part of that narrative is, well, it's not as much fun anymore because you're not crawling around on your hands and knees looking for something. You Instead, you're just, it just pops up on your screen. But there, there obviously are a lot of other ways to define what that job really is. What is it for you? How would you describe it, say, differently from David Bergman? Okay, <laughs> let's see. Um, Dave and I don't always agree on these things. Okay, well, that's what so, I was kind of gleaning. I, Ask him what I, he thinks about Harry Potter sometimes. <laughs> there are some outtakes. I, I love Dave Bergman. I'm happy to have a drink with him. You know, we're, we're good. But um, I also love the hunt. But to me, uh, the thing that I like the most is finding the end home for something. I love mm. finding something and knowing I have the perfect person for it. You know, I have a collector who's obsessed with one particular thing and I have found something that they're just going to go wild when they see it. And that's mm. the part that I like. I kind of like how we can use these books not only to have human connections but to like celebrate our each other's eccentricities like I love when someone's like I collect books only related to elephants so if you find a book about elephants I want it like I love the weird people and I love that this career brings me in contact with them and lets me sort of enable their eccentricities that's the joke that I have I'm an eccentricity enabler so that's what I really like about it is that it's a way for someone weird like me to see other people's weirdness and enjoy the passion that they're bringing to it mm -hmm. and the hunt is just one aspect of that I mean it's yeah. a great aspect but it's only one part how about you, Dan? How, how would you define your mission? Well, certainly part of it is is what Rebecca just said. Um, you know, you, you encounter all these characters and it is um, this moment when you can delight them with a find, you know, that fits into the, their their collection that they, they, they don't have. And some of them have been, have been doing this for years and years. Now it goes in both directions because you can find people who can frustrate you over and over again, asking you for something you think you found the perfect thing. Anyone who's done book fairs um, is familiar with these characters who walk around, some of them with signs. They actually wear signs around the book fair telling you what they're looking for. Um, but, you know, there's, it, to me, it's amazing that books have survived that they do survive as long as they do, and that they, they hold these secrets um, that maybe people on, in the past few hundred years haven't discovered yet. So antiquarian booksellers are still finding things about books that they, that they handle that have obviously been around for hundreds of years, and that no one has made that same, you know, has seen 
that little moment that suddenly pops out to them. And you, as you do this for many years, you get better and better at seeing why certain books stand out as being so important. So you may have five, 10 copies of the same book and it's like, oh, another one of those, but then you see something in it. So to me, it's the connection between the owner of the book um, and the, the book itself that I, I've always been, been quite drawn to. Do you, um, do you guys find that the internet has started like kind of prompting collectors to kind of redefine how, what they consider collecting to be? Because obviously, you know, standard modern first, it's like I think is kind of what Dave is, you know, kind of making fun of a little bit is that mode is now like obviously so much easier because of the internet. Um, but so, I mean, it seems to me that a lot of what's happening then is that people, what they consider, what they're interested in as a collection needs to evolve to kind of, um, at least the sort of exciting, sort of groundbreaking kind of stuff to fit into this different model of like information and access, like what's accessible and what's hard to find or put together. You just have to change the parameters of your hunt. You know, if your hunt is just find this author and title, sure, that's, that is, that is a lot easier. However, you know, I think about, um, I think it was referenced in the, the documentary, um, Heather and I, who's also in the documentary, we have a book collecting prize and it's for young women. And one of the, one of the um, honorable mentions for that, she was part of an online fan community of geisha in Kyoto. And as part of being this fan of this community, what they did was they were trying to rebuild the geisha community. And they were doing it through trying to track down documentation of the tea houses and all of the, you know, the, the yearly dance programs and things like that. And so she, through her fan community, figured out ways to search online for this material. And then she would bring it back to her fan community in order to fill in gaps in this sort of reconstruction, historical reconstruction they were doing. So it was like crowdsourced, but also like a different type of hunting and that's a mo mode of collecting that pretty much did like wasn't in existence 20 years ago and so there are new ways to collect that the internet actually gives us a new and different platform to explore so to me it's a question of evolution and pivoting than it is a oh no the world has ended and there's nothing new to replace it well, i think sarita is kind of trying to yes. like understand a very current cultural moment through a set of documentation essentially that's you know wouldn't necessarily always been thought of in the book trade, but is very much now moving into that phase and using a lot of sort of eBay internet sort of ex po access points to get a hold of it. And that's the thing about books and book collecting is, you know, books are a reflection of our civilization. So whatever you're interested in, like there's a book about it, right? right? And there are manuscripts and there's other material part of what we call print culture that you can find. And so, you know, the possibilities are really just they're only restricted by your own imagination. And so if you wanna collect in ways that worked really well before the internet, then the internet is going to mess that up. But if you look at the internet as an opportunity of, oh, I can connect with so-and-so in England who I wouldn't have been able to connect with before who could track down this one source I was looking for. Like, there are just so many new ways that you can do it if you just think, okay, why don't I just think new? So I want to ask you a couple of quick questions about just the things that happen in the film. And so Steve, I'm going to call for Subway in just a second here, but there's some, most of these characters that we meet are people that we've never heard of before and we fall in love with them and they're terrific, but there's one or two people that we, we do know. Uh, one of them is Fran Lebowitz, who is also right now in Pretend It's a City with Martin Scorsese. I think she's also being added to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. She's going to be like smoking woman or something with the Avengers. But uh, let's uh, see a little bit of Fran Lebowitz here in the film. Yeah, I think the death of the book is highly overrated. I go on the subway a lot, and the people that I see reading books, actual books on the subway, are mostly in their 20s. This is one of the few encouraging things you will ever see in a subway. And I told this to my editor, and he said, that the people who read mostly on the Kindle are mostly in their 40s. Yeah, I don't know why millennials are getting so much slack for like killing bookstores. We're carrying it, we're reading, we're buying. As much as this idea that books are dying or they're somehow crumbling, which is of course not true, try to open a file from your computer seven years ago. It's a hit or miss proposition. You can of course open any book from 500 years ago and think about and read what's there. 
books survive in incredible numbers. People don't like destroying them. They don't burn very well. People don't like throwing them away. Even illiterate people won't throw books away because they have this sort of sense of magic in them. I personally have never been able to throw a book away. I have seen books like in trash, and it, to me, it's like seeing like a human head in the trash, even if it's a horrible book. So, um, yeah, there's two kind of famous names, I think, associated with, well, in addition to Re Re Rebecca Romney, who we'll get into her fame in just a second. Uh, but so how did you, D.W. Young, how did you attract Fran Lebowitz to this project? Well, we just asked her if she wanted to do an interview, really. Um, and, you know, she, um, she just had, you know, I think, written or not she doesn't really write but she had you know been interviewed and spoken um, many times kind of about New York book culture and you know as an advocate of physical books and you know um, bookstores and libraries and stuff so I think and of course she's you know a caustic wit about everything and um, and is I think always critical and so that all seemed like a great addition to the film from outside Mm -hmm. the rare book world um just to add a little perspective and you know keep a, a, a point a, you know a point from outside of you know the world of the dealers and the other name uh, is uh, on the executive producer part of the marquee and uh and a little bit of voicing and that's parker posey so how did she become attached to this project well, Parker came on later. She um, she sort of came up, kept coming up in conversation a bit, um, sort of with various sort of intersecting points. She um, she had written a book recently and um, herself, and she's very well known in the library world. I think from Party Girl, which is a sort of among certain people uh, a sort of a cult movie from the '90s that she's great in, and um, it's sort of she becomes a librarian. It's like as her life calling. She comes to that. <laughs> Um, but she's really like, I know, I know someone who was inspired to become a librarian from that film. Um, and so I thought that was kind of compelling. And um, she also had a great voice to do the voiceover, I thought, in the beginning. And she's just a, like, also just, I think, uh, oh, and she um, was a frequent um, patron of um, Skyland Books, um, which isn't around anymore, but um, is, you know, represented in the film. And um, so knowing that she also was a book lover, we just, you know, approached her as well and said, you know, would you be interested in this film? And she wanted to take a look and she really liked it. And I think as someone who's long been involved in independent film, she understood, you know, um, it's helpful to help support smaller films. And it was great that she wanted to do that. Hey, Dan, um, you know, I just got through, I'm a little late to the party with this, but I just got through watching the first season of How To with John Wilson. And in the sixth episode, the final episode of the season, you see COVID starting to arrive and you realize that he's not going to be able to do what he does uh, for a while. And so that whole last episode is about that. How close did you guys come with this in, in terms of, uh, of making the movie? Were you all wrapped and safe by the time the, the virus started to hit? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, we, we premiered at the New York Film Festival in October of, of 19. Mm -hmm. um, and so obviously we're fine still at that moment. You could, you could see there were already those, uh, you know, whispers and then getting louder and louder in the early part of 2020. Mm -hmm. And the film was set to have its theatrical premiere to coincide with the New York Book Fair, which was really, you know, cutting it close because I think the writing was on the wall already there. So uh, definitely the film, you know, Kind of ran up against the wall because New York basically shut down, right? DW was it was uh, after our first week, and we were we were set to have this very long run and to open in all different cities around the country, and um, so yeah, you obviously that was a, a big disappointment for us. And, and I'm also wondering, Rebecca, how much does it affect the profession? I mean, in some ways, this feels like a job you can do a lot of without having to get face to face with a lot of people, but. There's also clearly a, a very human and, and per person-oriented component to it. So how, how does it affect your work? It has had a pretty big effect on the, I mean, we don't have in-person book fairs anymore, for example. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big hit, not only to the client development and developing new leads, for example, but also 
um, just in terms of revenue it, that matters. Um, but on the other hand, it's true. There's a lot of things that you can do just from your laptop. And, and these days, you know, a phone call or an email is how I communicate with a lot of my clients. Um, it's much trickier to acquire in this environment because generally we go on house calls. You know, we're going into people's homes and often house calls involve people who are older because they're really looking to get rid of their books. As, as you saw kind of in that clip, a lot of people aren't really excited about getting rid of their books. And so the only people who generally are and are the people who are like, I really need to downsize. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about visiting someone who is in a more, more vulnerable age group in the pandemic, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So things like house calls where we actually get our material, those have been severely, severely restricted. And even things like auctions, normally you want to go and preview because you just don't know what you're gonna get. Auctions are caveat emptor, they are final sale. And now, you know, you can buy things on in auction online, but you don't get to see them in person before you do. And that's a greater risk. So, we are still operating. People are still buying books. We are still selling and shipping them, but it has uh, required a bit of creativity. DW, there's one couple in the movie, and I think we just saw them in the clip too. They're about to take over, I think, what has been a shoe store or some kind of hip looking clothing store and turned it into uh, a rare book emporium. Okay. Those of us who are watching the movie are going, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't know what's coming. You don't want to do that. Do you know, I mean, have they been okay? Did they make it out okay? Have they been able to survive the pandemic? Yeah, it's uh, Eric and Jess at Left Bank. But they're not a couple, though. They're just business partners. Yeah, um, okay. As far as I know. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, um, but they, um, I stopped by and saw them a couple months ago, briefly outside and, and chatted with them a little bit. They seem to be doing as well as one can do, I guess. I mean, they're holding it together, I, I think. So I didn't get into too much detail, but I know they've been um, keeping the store open and um, so yeah, I, I, I mean, hopefully I visited, they're able to keep doing it. I visited them. And in fact, there's, they had a couple of pop-up events. Arthur, one for one, uh, about a half a week, moved in next door, had a little pop-up shop. I think for most booksellers, the online orders actually have been quite strong during the mm -hmm. pandemic and the same reason why, you know, you, when you look at business models everywhere, the, the ones that um, where people can sit at home and order things, um, they've done quite well. And that certainly um, fits our, our model in terms of the online selling portion. But as Rebecca was saying, from a buying perspective, it's, it's just not the same. So I, I wanna talk a little bit about how in fact, this movie tells us um, the way forward and, and in one of the ways uh, I think that we see is that some of this material may be bought and sold a little bit less and maybe find its way. Well, I, I actually want to ask that as a question, but in order to do that, uh, let's show a clicks, clip. So our final clip, Steve, is going to be Schomburg and, and, and we'll show that. Uh, because as I was sitting there watching the movie and taking notes, I uh, at one point wrote, fewer stores, more museums, question mark? I, I wasn't really sure, but let's see a, a little bit from the film right here. I think the difference between an archive and say something someone collected is that it contains the whole of the work and it contains the messy bits and the unexpected bits. At the Schomburg, in terms of rarities, we have everything from Malcolm X's papers to Lorraine Hansberry's and James Baldwin's papers. And Baldwin was born and raised in Harlem and he learned to read, some say, at the Schomburg Center. So it's very much him coming home here. And what I love about his archive is that it contains everything from notes for novels to the finished novels to the many drafts that he would do. There's notes taken in bars. There's things written on hotel stationery. There's the full array of Baldwin as a, a learning-to-be writer, including early poems and things like that, to him becoming the writer that we know and love. So Rebecca, I'm gonna ask you to weigh in first here because a lot of this is about the future and the future might involve things that turn up in, in museum type collections like this, but also contained in that clip is the idea of, oh, we'll, we'll also be collecting other stuff that maybe wasn't pri such a priority uh, until we began to define the mission uh, a little bit more broadly. So maybe you can speak to that a bit. 
Sure. So, you know, what, what Kevin was showing there, Kevin Young of the Schomburg, was, you know, James Baldwin's archive. And a lot of dealers, myself included, Dan included, we also handle archives. And mm -hmm. that is, when we talk about the rare book world, it actually envelops a lot more than just books bound in codex format. It generally means any sort of print literary culture um, material. And so, yes, archives are part of that, you know, autographs, manuscript material. Sometimes it can even be art, you know, people's fashion designer's sketchbook, for example, or photographs of a famous dancer, for example. It can be all sorts of things that are just related to the arts and a material culture. And so um, a lot of us have been working in that field for a while, and there have been some institutions who've been collecting aggressively that way. You know, since the mid 20th century, um, UT Austin, the uh, Ransom Center is a good example of that. And that's just one strand, one trend in, in rare books as a collectible market. And it is a very strong um, trend right now. So a lot of dealers make a good deal of their living selling to institutions. But I, I, I try to think more in terms of diversifying revenue streams to get business-like on you. And to me, that's just one aspect of what we do in the trade. Yeah, I, I want to, everybody else to talk about that too. Um, and Dan, maybe you can chime in next. This, this film does present visions of a future that's a little bit different from maybe the most conventional understanding of what an antiquarian bookseller can do. So uh, I don't know, how do you see the way forward? Well, as I said before, a, a lot of, it's not, um, before it was, there was something called the gentleman's library. There were certain titles that you would go into almost any apartment in New York City. And if the people were of a certain economic status, they, they would have certain books reliably on, on their shelves. And those books, I mean, first editions of them still quite sought after. But I, I think collecting in many ways is so much more interesting now because this whole, as, as Arthur says, has one line about the dreaming uh, together on paper or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sort of, there's, there are these strands that one can pursue. Um, and if you collect long enough, everything that you collect suddenly becomes an archive. So things don't necessarily start off. I mean, even you, a, a young James Baldwin isn't thinking about his papers. He's thinking he's becoming a writer. So all these, Tid, these bits and pieces that later become such a significant historical um, body of, of, of work that, um, that, that Kevin was talking about, it starts off you know, much smaller than that. So I think in, in terms of finding things that are unique, manuscript things, um, ephemera of all kinds, that, that certainly, I can tell you one conversation I had with a librarian, um, speaking of letters, well, we don't really write letters in the same way anymore. So mm -hmm. something came up, a contemporary author, they, are, they were getting an appraisal done and they weren't sure how to evaluate emails. I mean, before, if someone had 250, 300 letters, it's a big deal from, from, a, from a famous author. But what if you're talking about thousands of emails? Well, it's very tricky. So there are components like that that I imagine in the future will be, will be interesting. And also just the fact that some books aren't meant to survive. I think it was Columbia, I was speaking to someone up there that they were going through a digitizing process of all their sort of pulp paperbacks and things that obviously the paper is so acidified that it eventually will not be handleable, you know, in, that, in the same way as, as many other books, earlier books, oddly. Well, Susan, oh, Susan yeah, go ahead. Oh, Susan Orlean raises, I think, a really good question when we're talking about her archive about, you know, what has word processing done to archives in the writing process and um, any evidence of that process? Because let's face it, most writers don't keep all the notes and changes they've made on their Word or Google Doc or whatever format they're working in. Um, yes, maybe they've kept different versions, but maybe those don't survive or whatever. So you really potentially lose a tremendous amount of that kind of information. And, in the digital age, um, which poses some challenges. You know, uh, DW, one of the things that I didn't expect to find in your movie, but found very fascinating, was the segment about the kind of the development of uh, hip hop print magazines, how a lot of those never got digitized. Uh, and as a result, they, they are, they've kind of fallen into an interesting little crack there. Maybe you can say a little bit more uh, about that and, and how you saw that fitting in to uh, the story of this movie. Yeah, I think, you know, I was really interested as at a certain point, I think along the way I had 
you know, a lot of the process of making the movie is a sort of process of invest, investigation and a learning process on my part. And, and obviously Dan was like, there as an expert advisor all along. But I also, of course, you know, was connecting, making my own connections about certain things or making my own inquiries and we would compare notes. And, um, but I think at some point I, I was really curious and I think Rebecca mentioned this, the, the prize that she and Heather had um, created was really eye-opening to me, I think as an initial point there just what's new, what's what's really new? Like what's below the radar of traditional collecting that even a lot of dealers maybe are not even kind of um, onto yet that much, you know, maybe some, but it's not like, it hasn't really established itself. And so I thought also Arthur Fournier, who um, is in the film, he actually is, was the, the bridge to Sarita. She works with him often and they know each other well. And um, I was talking about, you know, what, who are some collectors that you think are doing kind of really new and interesting stuff outside of kind of the, the traditional mold and he mentioned Sarita and I'm, you know, I love 90s hip hop and it sort of meant something to me too, you know, from that era and um, sort of fascinated by that. So that's kind of what led us to her. And I think that fits right in where Rebecca, you know, was talking about Dan too, that it's still print culture at the end of the day. I mean, the music isn't maybe, but the writing about the music, the journalism about the music is, is absolutely with under the umbrella of the rare book trades. But, and it also is just the fact that it was so recent, it was such recent history and the fact that even things from the night, you would assume that everything from the nineties has been digitized, right? But in fact, yeah. it hasn't. And um, so it's, that's really the answer. You know, um, one of the, um, somebody from the audience just sent me a question that I think is, uh, could lead us to an interesting discussion. And that is, you know, we're living in this area, era, era where so many things happen on Zoom and now people's bookshelves behind them on Zoom. <laughs> turned into a thing and you've got Twitter accounts like Room Raider and other stuff that just, you know, people are looking and oh, he's got Robert Caro's the uh, power broker uh, on the bookshelf behind him. And, you know, uh, for Rebecca and Dan, it also does bring up the question of why do people want certain books? And Rebecca, you said, well, you know, I mean, it's, it's lovely and inspiring if somebody wants every possible book about elephants, but people want books for all kinds of reasons too. And, and, uh, maybe you could just say a little bit more about that. I mean, I, I've always thought that some people want books not because they, just some people I'm saying, want books not because they love the books, but because they feel they should have that book or they want to be able to display that book. And, and I'm, Rebecca, I'm kind of wondering for you as somebody who has to go get that book for them, whether you care one way or another about their motivations. Um, I try really hard not to be a snob about <laughs> what I do. I, um, I, you know, I don't look like a traditional rare book dealer. Um, I have faced my share of snobbery from my colleagues in the trade, and it's not something I'm keen to pass on to people who have different tastes, different opinions, or different approaches. And I think in a bit, in large part, because I, you know, I have experienced it myself, I feel like that's a real barrier to entry into the trade. And I feel like when people are interested in book collecting in any form, it's my job to educate them. It's my job to say, okay, if you are, you know, going to buy a first edition of this book, you know, you may be doing it to show off, but you are a caretaker of this book now. For this for this generation so you need to do x y and z keep it out of sunlight that type of thing and so you know as long as they're taking care of it i don't actually care what their motivation is i just want to see it survive to the next generation and sure maybe on a personal level i might enjoy my conversations more with someone who's a little bit more eccentric or really passionate about a particular thing but um really that's i don't consider that part of my job judging why people want it but, but that, you know, Dan, that brings up a question of why people do want it. In other words, you know, they could buy the book and donate it to an archive or a library where more people would have access to it. So why do people, I mean, I'm sure there isn't one reason, but in terms of the psychology of wanting to own a book that's old, expensive, hard to get, why do they want it? Yeah, I, you know, there are many different reasons, as you just said, it's not, there are, and there are people who collect on all different levels. I had an open bookshop um, and I had one occasion, I, I, will, I still remember one of our best customers. I mean, this person had so many books in their home, you, you could barely squeeze into it. He loved books as much as anyone I've, I've ever met. And he came in one afternoon with this sad look on his face and he said to me, books have ruined my life. And I said, please don't say that, you know, but, and I don't, I don't think he, he sort of stayed with that, but 
it it does if you collect maybe to a certain point where the object itself is more important than than human relations mm-hmm. that's maybe it's an extreme example other people just want to collect one author um mm-hmm. i'm a generalist which in the book trade means i, I deal in all different types of books and, mm-hmm. and I also then get to see all different types of collections. So I, I also try not to be snobbish about it. I, people, I, I've gone and seen some of the strangest collections around one particular thing that didn't, weren't, wasn't necessarily valuable. Um, but I think there's, there's both a healthy and an unhealthy aspect to it. Um, you, can, you can get over obsessed, but it can also give you this tremendous joy. There's learning. Um, it's just like everything in life, you know, it's, it, it's a mixed bag. Yeah, DW, that must have been a part of the excitement for you directing this. I, as I was watching, another thing I jotted down at one point was just the word possession. And, and I was thinking in particular, there's an A.S. Byatt novel uh, called Possession about these people who are very competitively going after uh, some rare literary artifacts. And, and I realized even at the time that the title works on a number of different levels. But watching your movie, DW, I realized there's a way in which these people become possessed to a certain degree. Mm-hmm. The people that we see in the movie are, are not only interested in possessing a certain book, but they're kind of possessed by it too. Not quite in a, you know, William Peter Blatty uh, throwing up pea soup level, but, but you know, it, that must have been some of the allure for you too, to write, to... to people who have that kind of need yeah i think it's um i think but i think I, absolutely i mean i think it's always interesting to people who have a a real like um extreme sort of you know a passion like that's you know something outside of like sort of the middle of the road because you know i think in terms of a story or in terms of getting a, a personality that's always usually has more sort of to respond to on a very basic level but I, I think it's almost more the pursuit is what's for a lot of the collectors. It's, hmm. and that's kind of what Dave's referring to again. Yeah. Is like, he's he's I think nodding to that. Is that it's the pursuit that's what drives them. The actual once it's on the shelf, it's nice and it's you have that, you know, you have that possession. But I really think it's the act of the pursuing, the creation, the re, the, the devising, and all that, and the tracking down by whatever means you're doing, however you're considering it. Or um, so we don't. It doesn't have to be in that mo- only in that old older way necessarily um well, and i think it's, it's sorry just it was no, ahead, yeah. like books itself like you think about shakespeare's plays and you know a tragedy is going to end in death and a comedy is going to end in marriage but it's how you get there that's the point mm-hmm. and this process of collecting is you know you're doing research in order to learn about you know this particular writer who discovered this particular thing and oh can i get this first edition or oh was it the second edition when this idea first appeared in this book mm-hmm. and that process it's it's if you love to learn that's what book collecting is like you find the top that you just want to go in a deep dive in and collecting is essentially like a material way to um, explore that if you like history then you have like a hands-on way to to just enjoy your passion when, and and Rebecca while you have the floor we do have to talk about the elephant in the room and it's not an elephant book uh, it's it's pawn stars so for people I, I don't know how much penetration there is in the Greenwich Friends of the Library audience uh, of Pawn Stars. So if you're watching right now and that doesn't mean anything to you, Pawn Stars is sort of like Antiques Roadshow if the evaluators had handguns. And uh, P-A-W-N for the record, P-A-W-N, if you don't yes, know. Yes, Pawn Stars. Um, I, ho- I hope I did say that right. Uh, and, um, but so what's, what's the Pawn Stars version of what we're talking about right now? In other words, I have to be honest and say, I haven't actually seen you appear on that show. What do you wind up talking about or dealing with in that context? So the main setup is that someone comes into this pawn shop that has a reputation for handling historical or collectible items. They are trying to sell or pawn their item. The people who work there, if they don't know about an object, they will bring in a specialist. And I have been appearing on that show as the specialist for any rare books. And so uh, what happens is I walk in, I do what every rare book dealer does in their job on a daily basis, which is that I have two minutes to tell you why this book is worth the amount of money I'm about to say it's worth (laughs) and try to convince you of that in two minutes. And then I walk away and I'm done. So I might say this book is important because, you know, it was a 
general from the Civil War, you know, really important Union generals memoirs, like Ulysses S. Grant's memoirs are very famous. And so, okay, this is $850, you know, and I explain why. And then I walk off and then they haggle. And I think the haggling is really appealing. But, you know, the reason I think something like that's appealing is the same way something like Antiques Roadshow is appealing, which is this, this thrill idea that you might have something in your attic that is incredibly valuable and you just don't know. Um, the thing that I like about it is not that I think that that's often as true as people want it to be. Mm. I consider myself a destroyer of dreams. I am constantly <laughs> telling people that their books are not worth what they mm. think or hope they are, unfortunately. Um, but I like it because it makes people stop and say, hey, maybe I should just double check before I throw this thing out. And that's really what I care about. Just do a little due diligence, do a little bit of mm -hmm. research before you, you know, throw that in the dumpster. Because, you know, there are a number of people on the documentary who actually have gone dumpster diving for mm -hmm. books before. I mean, there are ones that get thrown out and it's our job to try to save the ones that are, we think are worth saving. One, one last question about this is, which is, is the kind of book that they bring in, I mean, they're not gonna bring in a Cervantes folio on Pawn Stars or- I have done Don Quixote on Pawn Stars, yes. Okay. I've done Dickens, I've done, yeah. Um, I will say a lot of it's American history. A lot of it is male authors. I think I've only done two women authors. <laughs> I don't think I've done a single black author, for example. Mm -hmm. So it does have its own sort of editorial focus. Um, American history is a big part of that focus. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's one more filter, you know, every, every, media angle of rare books is going to have its own filter and its own perspective. And that one's uh, heavily based in American history. You know, Dan, that leads me to something else I wanted to ask you guys about. And one of the reasons I love this movie so much is it really is about a lot of different things. It, it is about, it's about what it's about. It's about uh, booksellers, but it's also about change. Um, uh, it's also about certain kinds of personalities. But I think also to just kind of build on what Rebecca was just saying. It's also about how we assign value to things. How do we decide what something is worth? Um, and and I, I was fascinated by that. And of course there are things that we see in the movie that can materially alter that. You know, is it worth more if it's inscribed? What if it's inscribed to somebody really interesting? Or what if it's inscribed to somebody who's nobody? Maybe it's worth less that way. But I, I don't know. I don't even know what question I'm asking you exactly, except that maybe you could sort of give me your gloss on that a little bit. Like how do we just, how do you decide Believe it or not, there, there used to be author price guides. I mean, yeah. Alan Ahern, um, he, there was the Ahern Guide was something that was on every sort of antiquarian bookseller's shelf and it would have issue points. So if you wanted to, to look up a Hemingway or a Faulkner book, it would tell you if it was supposed to have this mark on the dust jacket or, um, or that. But people stopped using those, I think after a while. Um, values are tricky. It, it's like anything else. If you look at old auction records, some authors used to be very, very hot that are almost impossible to, to sell these days. Um, there was a movement for a while, not that long ago, maybe in the 90s for hyper modern fiction. And the prices were going up and up. And, then, and now they're just not enough customers for these books. And because they were printed in, in too large a number to really, you don't really have that many customers for them. So that's why I think you see more and more dealers gravitating to unique material, one of a kind things where you can, to a certain extent, play with the price a little bit more. And also the person who's buying it um, is getting something that isn't, you know, that they're not necessarily going to see the, across the booth or the next time they go into a bookshop. Um, so I think that, that there's always that maneuverability in, in, the, in the pricing that's going to change over time. But also, isn't it? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, it also that you guys also have a sense beyond just the market about who's looking for certain things. So a book that is very a very odd book about elephants, maybe, that's <laughs> not by any normal standard very valuable, but Rebecca knows this one person who would kill for that book. Well, it's she has the ability then to price it differently and it is suddenly valuable in the with the right connections being made. Yeah, right. Book go over and look for their Babar books now. What were you saying, Rebecca? That a book's only worth what someone will pay for it, you know, on the right. secondhand market, that's really what it comes down to. And sometimes, you know, we, we will make guesses on pricing when we don't have exact 
comparables. You know, we're talking about, say you have a really great association copy, you know, Hemingway inscribed to Fitzgerald or something like that. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, if you don't have a direct comp, uh, which is to say you don't have another book that is just as, you know, with Hemingway inscribed to Fitzgerald, then you may have a, a much harder time figuring out the price and you have to actually sort of price based on your own um, feeling about how important it is. And mm -hmm. then the market tells you whether you're right or not. You know, yeah. if you're sitting on it for a really long time, then maybe you priced it too high. And if you get five orders for it, when you advertise it, maybe you priced it too low, you know, that, that you are having to sort of pivot with the market. That's part of what we do. Yeah. But it, it makes sense that some of it becomes instinctual. Uh, and you're saying those instincts are either validated or, or not. Yes. Um, yeah, so, I, I, yeah, go ahead. I saw uh, someone who was in the film, Jim Cummins, who you described him, you know, the fellow with the mustache. Yeah. I watched, I was young at the time, and I, he lifted a book up to his face, and he <laughs> sniffed it. I said, Jim, what, what are you doing? And he says, I want to see if it smells right. And I, you know, it was just a line. But um, after a while, I, I think I, I understood what he meant, much more than I did at that, at that moment, exactly. So um, it, it's, it's hard to, I think in the book, Blink, it talks about when looking at forgeries, it's that mm -hmm. initial reaction to something. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's certain authors in particular you can look at. And if you've seen lots of letters or, or books inscribed by that person, if you see hesitation or something like that, it just kind of hits you as wrong. So right or wrong, it, it, it's surprising how much that enters into sort of a snap decision. And that's in the film a little bit with Heather talking about book sense specifically, you know, it really is about handling the books. That's how you learn the job is by handling a lot of the material. You can't mm. shortcut it just by studying a lot. For example, it really is material artifacts that you are having in your hands. So DW, I've become a, a fan and I want to see all your future movies. Um, okay. you know where you're going next with this. Once again, tough time to, make documentary movies while there's a pandemic going on. But yeah. maybe especially wondering whether the experience of this movie has pointed you in maybe a direction you wouldn't have gone in had you not had this experience. I don't know, not necessarily. Um, but I think every movie is like, you, you come out of every movie like changed, you know what I mean? So mm -hmm. when you make a film, whatever, whoever you were before you started making it, you're definitely not exactly the same person after. And that's one mm -hmm. of the interesting things about like, I think all arts are that way, but film is this sort of, you engage it on so many levels, both physically, emotionally, you know, um, in terms of the craft. There's just, it's such an all out engagement. Um, so I, I think it, you don't always realize at the time how it's changed you. You may mm -hmm. sort of have a sense of it. So I think it's more interesting to look back after like another movie or two. Yeah. Then you say, okay, yeah, that's why maybe I was interested in in the next thing or, or but I also also really try not to do the same thing twice and really force myself to um, change it up as much as possible. I'm not entirely every single thing, but you know, really consciously not do the same thing over again. So um, there's always that too. Do you know what you're gonna do next? Uh, I got a few things, um, but I don't know that I want to get there. Are probably too much things to do right now. Yeah, right, exactly. You, people usually never do want to um, answer that question. Uh, all right, I'm going to just look at uh, for a moment at some of the questions that have been coming in uh, from the crowd here. Um, so uh, somebody asked, and I, I guess this is more for Rebecca or Dan, whether the pandemic will speed up the digitization of books, all media, stuff like that, that there maybe is there more of an impulse, I guess the question is to get stuff in a digitized form so that the kind of face-to-face -face stuff is, is less necessary. Does one of you want to tackle that one? Um, I, I will say that this has been a priority of institutions for a while now, and it's not the pandemic that awakens it. It's actually a question of funding and resources. There are people who are trained to do it. They just, it costs time. It's time, money, labor, and that, that money needs to put in so that people can be hired to do the labor. And I think people really underestimate too what we talk about with digitization. Like it is tens, hundreds, thousands of documents and books and you know, an individual book has hundreds of pages even on its own. So a process of digitization is massive and takes decades. And so this is something we're actually 
in the middle of and we continue to do. And, you know, there's always the hope that maybe people who are donors might see the pandemic as an impetus to put more funds there. But there's already very good work being done on the institutional side ar around this. Yeah, I actually got to watch the, the Folger Shakespeare Library digitizing a book mm. and it took place over two days. Of, mm. I mean, they've, and they've got quite a machine. It's not one that I even, I mean, I think a lot of institutions don't have something like that. This was uh, an incredible uh, operational tool. But from on a personal, on a private, which is the other part of the question, it's just like, you know, the idea that I, I was never worried that the iPad or, or, you know, these digital books would replace the act because the object itself, the tactile object of holding a book and turning the page is such um, a, a major component to what the enjoyment is all about. I mean, you, you love, you just are drawn into it by the, by holding it. I, I, I still love holding books, even on days when I'm in a bad mood, which is, often lately, um, I, holding them is something I, I want to do. And I, I can't imagine people who love books would ever want to give that up. Well, and you know, a lot of people ask like, oh, is your job going to be obsolete because everything's moving digitally? And, you know, for the most of the history of the print, of print in the West, you know, we're talking about Europe and Gutenberg and such, the, no, the print run, the average print run for the truly more than half of the history of print is about 750 copies to 1000 copies in an edition. So even if we went to, you know, everything is digitized, they might do just one special limited edition of even 1000 copies seems very low today. You know, like, we still have hundreds of years of the history of print, and that would just bring us back to what has been normal, you know, so Dan and I both handle books from what it's called the hand press period, you know, where the editions are 300 copies, 750 copies, 1000 copies, like, this is normal and the the world where we move into mostly digital is not to me a threat at all. It's just, a, again, just an interesting development. It creates new possibilities that are exciting. So I, I like this question here and I think it once again is it's for both of you. The question is how would you encourage young people to collect um, as a hobby, et cetera? And, and I think that's an interesting question uh, maybe somebody who is young watches this movie and thinks, wow, I would like to have a book collection. So Dan, how would a person, how would a young person be best advised to think about that? Yeah, I, you know, you see certain moments in the film when Jim Cummins talks about a book that would be $40 million. You're like, is this really for me? But I, I've seen some very interesting collections formed with, with not that much money at all. It's so we, we learned to maybe not judge a book by its cover, but books of course do have covers and some of them um, can be quite wonderful. So I've, I've seen people piece, piece together um, collections of, of certain dust jacket art or, or covers. Really you wanna collect what you love. That's the first thing. And not to be intimidated that you have to, to form a collection um, by spending a lot of money because it's often a lot more satisfying I think to do it um, in more of the nook and cranny kind of way where you're, you're finding little things that fit into what you collect that, that aren't expensive. Rebecca, what would you tell a young person? Well, so I mentioned before, uh, Heather and I founded a book collecting prize. It's actually for young people, young women. It's for young women age 30 and younger in the United States, the Honey and Wax Prize. And there are a few things that we give as advice for people who are applying to this prize. And um, one of them, besides collecting what you love, which is absolutely rule number one, if you're collecting what you love, that's really the only thing that matters, in my opinion. But if you want to get really specific and sort of level up, as it were, the next question is, you know, you're not not just collecting titles, you're collecting historical artifacts. You know, there are many different books of Moby Dick. Moby Dick is the title, but you can get the first edition or you can get the edition illustrated by Rockwell Kent in 1930 after it had its sort of re renaissance and critical acclaim. Or, you know, you can get a modern edition illustrated by, you know, some new illustrator that you love, or you can get the Folio Society, right? Each of those is a different version of that same text and each is a product of its own time and place. It's a historical artifact. So the, the question that you ask after, you know, why am I collecting this topic because I love it is, why this copy of this book? Why am I interested in this over any other one that I could get online? And that's when you're starting to become this sort of like this history, like sleuth. Okay, I am looking for this particular copy of this book because, you know, oh, the, the publisher didn't like the illustrations, so they suppressed it, you know, and you get into the stories behind each of these books. And that's when it really starts to get fun is when you start asking the question, why this version? Why this copy? 
Um, we're going to be wrapping up here pretty soon. We've gone a little bit long because there were some people who were having trouble getting into the, the Zoom room, and that's why we're, we're stretching it out a, a little bit. Um, DW, one of my favorite scenes in this movie is the dinner, um, yeah. where suddenly you see a lot of these characters that we've mostly seen alone in their frames or maybe with one other uh, bookseller. Uh, now they're all gathered around a table and they're kind of talking shop and they're talking about uh, this business just beats the crap out of your body and you lose three inches of height and all this kind of stuff. And it, it, it was so much fun because it felt so real. Maybe it goes back to what Rebecca said at the very beginning of our conversation that she wanted to see the world that she actually knows. And, and But I guess I, I first I wanted, was that dinner going to happen anyway? Or did you as a filmmaker say, hey, would 12 of you be willing to go out to dinner and let me film it? Yeah, it was something we staged. Um you know, at a base level. Um, but I think it, insofar as it was a scenario that could very well happen where the people assembled could more or less find themselves at a, a dinner event or after a show or, you know, uh, uh, so they could have come together in that way. And I think that kind of, I think it's, you know, that kind of um, situation is normal for people in the book trade where I think as Rebecca mentions maybe it's something that didn't even make the cut. I can't remember sometimes, but but how everyone in the trade is introverts except for the times you have to be an extrovert. And um, so like book fairs and stuff being that. But so, and I think we just wanted to try and find a way to get in a different kind of interaction that was a, in a different mode than just an interview or a point where people are, you know, more self-conscious about being in front of the camera and where they could be a little more freewheeling and uh, kind of just let them go. And so we actually filmed the whole, much longer than that. I tried very, very hard to keep more of it in the movie. Um, but at the end of the day, it was like, you know, talking about there being a lot of things in the movie and I'd like to try and get as many things as possible if I can get them all to kind of weave together, hopefully. But that was just one step beyond what was plausible, really. But we were able to use that portion at the end, which made it all worth it. I think. Yeah, it really kind of brought the movie home somehow. You know, it really kind of landed the plane a little bit for me anyway. All right, well, we're gonna stop now. Uh, I, first of all, I wanna say, this has been so much fun. I mean, the next time I, we all gather together, probably you're going to have to wear pants uh, instead of whatever you're wearing now. And, you know, it won't it's be cold out there, man. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but but this was this was so much fun. And I first of all I want to thank uh, all of the people here on the on the panel: uh, Rebecca Romney, Dan Wexler, and D.W. Young, and uh, to, to the library for hosting us. And I guess I'll just end with one other kind of author's story, uh, which is that one thing that happens to you when you're an author uh, is that you walk into not a store like the ones we see in the movie, but a more you know street level kind of used bookstore. And if you're an author, one of the things that you almost inevitably do is go and look and see if they have any copies of your book. Um, and that in almost, well, I mean, it doesn't happen without a fail, but from time to time you have the experience of pulling your book off a shelf opening it up and seeing a book that you've inscribed to someone you know actually pretty well <laughs> who has seen fit to sell it. Um, and it's always a very kind of deflating feeling that, oh, oh my God, they, could, they couldn't, you know, they moved and they couldn't hang on to my book. So, uh, so please bear that in mind if you're out there and you're about to downsize your book collection, don't uh, sell the books where the authors are gonna see that you, you sold them because it, it hurts our feelings a lot. But uh, rather than leave you with that thought, I would just simply say, this is a terrific movie. It is a lot of fun. I'm gonna watch it again. Uh, and I certainly uh, thank you guys for coming out tonight. And thanks to the Greenwich Library for inviting me to be a part of this and everybody else, I would say, drive safely, but I don't really think that's an issue this time. So bye-bye y'all. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thank thanks you. a lot.